Okay, so I'm going to talk about something uh, a lot more focused, but uh, also e equally as unknown. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm a PhD student in the uh, University of Cambridge, but I'm going to talk about the work that I did uh, in Kyoto uh, with Fuyuki Ishikawa for the last two years, and it was about uh, DNA PK and PEDS, DNA damage induced transcription of stress response genes. So even though it's focused, I think that it's dealing with uh, three pretty interesting concepts. So DNA damage repair, uh, DNA damage induced transcription, and uh, low dose stress response, and seeing how those three different things are interacting with one another. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a bunch of stuff in the intro. Uh, I'm not going to have a lot of time to go over the actual data, but I have it all in my poster so we can talk about it if anyone is interested. So anyway, so I'm going to talk about all these things, but I'm going to start with stress and acquired tolerance. So how can we study stress? So we can apply stresses to cells or organisms and see what happens. So how can we study on a cellular level stress? So we can take our cells and we can apply a lethal stress and the cells will die. And then we have an obvious phenotype, so we know what kills the cells and what doesn't. But let's say we wanted to study a low dose stress, which is what we experience more in our daily lives, like giving uh, a talk or something. And so then you have like cells, and uh, you have a low dose stress, and the cells uh, appear to have no obvious phenotype. So uh, you can obviously look at all kinds of stuff about what's going, in going on inside the cell, but let's say you then apply lethal stress. So most of the cells do die, but some of the cells uh, actually survive. And so this is what's called acquired tolerance, at least in the lab that I was working in. Some people refer to it as hormesis, uh, but that has some bad connotations, I think. So anyway, so how do cells respond to stress molecularly? Uh, one way is through cellular response proteins, such as the HSPs or heat shock proteins, which people talked about earlier in the meeting. Uh, and uh, during, these, uh, during cellular stress response, these proteins basically uh, transport, help uh, facilitate damage and degraded or uh, s proteins t t to the outside of the cell. So two examples of HSPs. I'm going to be talking, I'm going to be talking about heat. heat yeah. Yeah. It's a different reaction, I guess, yeah. yeah, it is different. But a lot of times the stress, so I'm going to be talking particularly about HSPA1A and B, which are stress inducible. So not all the HSPs are stress inducible. These two in particular are stress inducible by different kinds of stresses, but I'll talk about heat. Okay, so how do cells acquire tolerance to stress molecularly? So uh, one way maybe is through chromatin remodeling, for example, of the stress response genes. So next, what's chromatin? Chromatin is the way the DNA exists inside of the uh, nucleus, and uh, I'm going to zoom in on a nucleosome. And so a nucleosome is uh, the DNA wrapped around the histone octamer, and this is a super simplified histone octamer, which is composed of eight histones, uh, two uh, and four different kinds, but uh, actually just lied to you, there are also histone variants, so I'm going to be talking about H33 in particular and H2AZ, and these variants can be associated with different chromatin states such as uh, euchromatin or active or open chromatin or heterochromatin, which is condensed and inactive. Uh, and then also, uh, of course, the histone uh, can have histone modification on the tail, which are also associated with different chromatin states. All right, so uh, HERA and its role in acquired tolerance. So what's HERA? Here is the histone chaperone responsible, it's a histone chaperone complex responsible for uh, putting HC3 into the nucleus, uh, nucleosome, and that's not at all how it does it, but uh, anyway. So basically, the current model of low dose stress response in mammalian cells was, uh, was put together by uh, Fuyuki Shikawa's lab uh, in this 2012 paper in uh, buddy, uh, fission yeast, and then uh, more recently in WI38 uh, H turret immortalized human lung fibroblasts. So the current model is that you have a low dose stress which leads to, which induces here a complex to localize at a stress response gene such as HSPA1A or B, and that induces its expression and uh, brings along RNA polymerase 2, and uh, that induces acquired tolerance. So the question that I originally wanted to ask is what is histone H53 doing? So what's histone H53? So it has a four to five amino acid difference from the canonical histones H31 and 2, which doesn't seem like a lot, but actually it can lead to a lot of different things in, in terms of its function. And the one important thing to think about in terms of its function for me was actually its deposition. So the canonical histone H31 or 2 is deposited only during replication by CAF1. So that's, again, not how it works, but anyway. And then uh, histone H33 can be deposited anytime by the HERA complex. So that's important because the stress can happen anytime, right? So that seems like a good model for how you want to maybe remodel the chromatin. 
Okay, so next I'm going to talk about DNA damage and transcription, which may not seem like an obvious uh, leeway into that, but it, I, I kind of ended up into that, going into that direction in terms of my research. So uh, normally we think of DNA damage as deleterious to the genome, but it turns out sometimes it's actually necessary for transcription. So one way, uh, one model by which it was, it's been shown to be necessary for transcriptional regulation is in this paper from Nature Communications in 2015, Bunch et al. And basically, they made a model for programmed DNA damage at the HSPA1A uh, slash B locus. So the, the model goes like this. So you have your uh, stress response gene here, and RNA poll 2 is paused downstream of this transcription start site of the gene. And then you have a stress or an activator which induces a lot of stuff to happen. So you have top wise summaries 2 coming here and making a double strand break, and then you have uh, DNA repair proteins like DNA PKCS and Ku, which I'll talk about later, that form a complex called DNA PK and ATM. And then also uh, you get DNA, cl like classic DNA damage markers like gamma H2X showing up. And then RNA polymerase 2 is going and transcribing the gene. So this has its own controversy, and I'm not going to go into that. But anyway, so uh, the original purpose of the study was to figure out what H33 was doing in this model uh, of uh, uh, low dose stress response. But what ended up happening was that I, I sort of was investigating this. And so I'll try to connect those two stories. So the model that I'm using again is wi 38 h to immortalized human lung fibroblasts. So I also use a couple of the other different cell lines just to make sure that it's not going on in just these cells. So the uh, first step that I did was uh, to identify the interactors of histone H33. And I did that by IP mass spectrometry. And I'm not going to go over it through the data, but I'm just going to give you the four top hits that I got and then verified uh, using uh, immunoprecipitation and immunoblotting. So first, uh, the first proteins are top isomerases 1 and 2. So top isomerase 1 makes a, a single strand break of the DNA, and top, top O2 makes a double strand break. And they're also involved in the real ligation, maybe. No one really knows. And then the, uh, there's the Ku complex which is involved with sensing uh, DNA damage at an early stage, people think, and it forms uh, another complex with DNA PKCS called DNA PK. And uh, lastly, PARP1, or poly-ADP ribose polymerase 1, which does a lot of stuff that no, <laughs> no one really knows what it does, but people think it might have to do with uh, sensing DNA damage. OK, so now I have this kind of image. So H33 is uh, binding with all, all these proteins, but what are they doing? So I looked, uh, I wanted to know the role of them and H33 in stress response. So to do that, I asked the question, are the interactors deposited at a heat shock locus following a low dose heat stress? And to do that, I did an experiment called chromatin immunoprecipitation, or CHIP. Uh, and uh, basically, you look for enrichment of a certain protein at a location of your choice. So in this case, uh, I did qPCR to do that. And uh, the locations that I, that I was interested in were HSPA1A, which again is the stress-inducible gene, and GAP-DH, which is just a control. So these are the different uh, loci I looked at. So two, two kilobases before the transcription start site, the transcription start site itself, and the open reading frame or gene body of HSPA1A. And then I just looked at some control regions of GAP-DH. OK, so now looking at the actual enrichment of proteins. So looking at total histone H3, at the HSPA1A locus, I found that there is a significant decrease following a low-dose heat stress. So this low-dose heat stress is I basically heated the cells to 40 degrees C for two hours. So human cells like to be grown at 37. So you, you don't see any actual pheno phenotypical change in the cells. But you do see this decrease in total histone H3 at the TSS. Next, I looked at histone H33, and I found that there's a significant increase of H33 at the TSS and the ORF of HSPA1A following the low-dose heat stress. OK, so that's interesting. So then I, I went on to look at the interactors. So I found, again, that PARP is uh, increased at the ORF of HSPA1A following a stress, and that TOP2 is uh, uh, increased at the ORF of HSPA1A following a low-dose stress. So I have this sort of <laughs> image now. After a stress, H33, TOP2, and PARP are all kind of there. And uh, I wanted to ask now about DNA damage. So we have TOP2A, which induces DNA damage, probably and PARP, which probably repairs it. So to look at DNA damage, I looked at gamma H2AX, uh, which going back to this original program DNA damage mar marker, uh, I mean model, you see that here's gamma H2AX, the marker of DNA damage. And I found that gamma H2AX is increased significantly at the TSS and the ORF of HSP1A following a low dose heat stress. 
All right, so I did some other experiments, which are on my poster, but I'm not, I don't have time to talk about. And basically, I tried to show that the DNA damage is what's responsible for the transcriptional upregulation of HSPONA. And so I found that top 2 a uh, makes a cut, and that maybe results in this DNA damage marker uh, coming, coming to this low side, following the low dose stress, sorry, again. Okay, so I think this is probably the last thing I can talk about, but uh, the DNA damage, so then I looked at uh, the DNA damage response itself. So I looked at the DNA damage, then I wanted to look at the response, and so this is looking at this part of the model. So they, this group said that DNA PK is responsible for, is important for the upregulation of HSP1A, and I didn't think that they had really adequate <laughs> data saying that, so I looked at that. So to do that, I, I did a knockdown of uh, DNA PK, and I did this uh, RT-QPCR experiment where I plated my cells, I infected them with the siRNA, and then I performed the sublethal stress and extracted the RNA, and then ran it on a QPCR. So this is just showing that the knockdown was pretty efficient. So I got a uh, knockdown of DNA PKCS, you know, in particular, which is the catalytic subunit of DNA PK complex. And then I found that if you, if you knock down DNA PK, you get a significant increase in the HSP1A expression following the low dose stress. Okay, so then I did an even a weird, <laughs> weird, weird experiment, w which, uh, oh, actually, no. So then I started using the DNA PK inhibitors because DNA PK uh, knockdown is kind of annoying to do. So I just found an inhibitor that would do, show the same thing. So I did the same experiment, but with an inhibitor this time. And I found that the inhibitor also increases HSP1A expression following a low dose heat stress. And I found that that's true also in other kind of cells besides WI38, so IMR90 and HD1080. Okay, so then I did a weird experiment, an acquired tolerance experiment, that's what I, I call them. So basically, I plate my cells, I treat them with an inhibitor at a normal temperature, then I treat them in in with an inhibitor without an inhibitor at a sublethal stress, and then I give them a lethal stress. And then I wait two days and I measure their viability. So this is the acquired tolerance experiment. So on the left, this is the control or DMS. So on the right, if you, you can see the images of each of these, but basically, let's just keep to the, the graph. So the DMSO is the control, and you can see that, so no stress, there's, I normalize it, so it's just 100, and then you look at uh, just a sublethal stress, it's pretty variable, but then you look at a lethal stress, and you get a depletion in the viability. And, but then if you look at the sublethal plus the lethal, or the acquired tolerance, you get an increase in viability. So then if you add the DNAPK inhibitor into that mix, you lose that lethal stress, uh, you, b you basically lose acquired tolerance, but that's because you're getting a gain in lethal stress tolerance. Okay, so then I looked at the effect of DNA PK inhibition on different things at the HSP1A locus using CHIP. So I looked at uh, top 2 a for example, and following a, a sublethal stress uh, and the DNA PK inhibition, I found that there's an increase of top 2 a at the ORF of HSP1A. And I found the same thing for gamma H2X, even though it looks a little bit less convincing. All right, so I found that, basically I found the opposite from what the model was showing, the DNA PK is negatively regulating the stress response gene HSP1A. And I don't have time to talk about, I think, DNA damage in histone variant H3, but essentially I did an H3 knockdown and I found, uh, I did similar experiments and I found that H3 and DNA PK are counter-regulating the stress response genes, HSP1A and B specifically. Okay, so just now looking at this model, uh, I just want to show what I did, summarize it. So I kind of showed that H gamma H2X is at the HSP1A locus, and so is top 2, and that it induces this DNA damage uh, following a low dose heat stress. But then uh, looking at DNA PK, it looks a little bit different. So based off of uh, my data as well as other people in the field, I made this model. So essentially, in s so you have an inactive stress response gene and uh, you have pole 2 pause downstream of the transcription start site. Then you have a stress, and that induces top 2 to localize and make a cut. And that now you have two options. So you have what I call the slow and safe transcription, or the fast and, uh, fast and risky transcription. So the slow and safe is DNA PK dependent, and this is what is basically the previous model, so I'll go through that first. So you have the cut, and then you have DNA repair coming here and repairing the DNA. And then you have transcription factors in H23 and HERA localizing. And then you have transcription of the gene, so you can respond to the stress. Okay, then the other side, the fast and risky transcription is DNA PK independent. So let's just say in a competition model, you have like 
DNA PK and uh, the transcription factor is sort of vying for binding at this site. So let's say the, the transcription factors are here at H23, get there first, and then you have actually transcription with the damage still there. And so this is probably the most controversial part of the model, but it, there, are, there are things that suggest that, that that might be the case. And then maybe, uh, we have no idea, but maybe then the DNA is repaired afterwards, because that would make sense. Okay, so, and then the question is, uh, is actually acquired tolerance not uh, a, a learned uh, ability to the lethal stress via the low dose stress, but actually maybe is it just cells that happen to be going through this pathway rather than this one. So they can respond to the stress faster since the gene is being upregulated faster. Okay, so uh, that's it. So I just want to thank Fuyuki Ishikawa and Mext for funding me uh, in Kyoto, and then also to my current advisor, Ann Ferguson Smith at Cambridge, who let me come here. All right, so that's it. Do top isomerase inhibitors block the stress response transcription? So yeah, okay. So I've I've tried that, and no, I couldn't even get the transcription, the top isomerase inhibitors to work at all. So none of the commercially available ones seem to actually be blocking all top isomerase activity. Specific, definitely not top two A. So can you actually show that? Each stress-inducible gene has a cut no. made by top two. No. So it's just a model. It's just a model. So you don't really know if, the, if there's damage to the DNA. I do know that there's damage to the DNA at specific stress response genes, not at necessarily all of them. So I know that there's definitely DNA damage happening at HSPA1A and B, for sure. Based on what? Okay. DNA is one hypersensitivity, footprinting, ataxic. Okay, so, okay, besides, you mean besides the DNA damage marker? Yeah, yeah, how do okay. you t detect the DNA damage? The DNA damage marker gamma H2AX, but that's not the only way. So, so uh, but the gamma H2AX is actually not a specific mark of DNA damage. You're right, yeah, that's true. Okay. It's, it's also when you have increased proliferation, yeah, but maybe that is maybe that is DNA damage. You know, it, it labels replication bubbles and. Yeah, but okay. So I think that the, that whole con that whole this whole idea maybe suggests that actually DNA damage is much more present than people think, and that it's actually going on all the time. But you're right. So gamma H two X may not be an actual marker of DNA damage, but so what I can do is so you know do you know what etoposide is? So etops etoposide. So it, it's not actually an inhibitor of top isomerase too, so this is just different. So a top side inhibits the real ligation mediated by top isomerase too, right? So I can show that if I add a top side here, uh, or if I add a top side here, I can get an upregulation of the HSPA1A gene. So that kind of suggests, and then there's also an increase in acquired tolerance and an increase in the gamma H2AX at that low side. But yeah, I mean, Ideally, maybe we could do s something else to show it. But if you use any other kind of stress and you look at other stress-inducible genes, you see the same phenomenon. So this model, I didn't, I wasn't, so I didn't go into it. But basically, this model actually has nothing to do with stress. So they initially showed it in HSPA1A, but then they extrapolated and use it for actually serum-inducible genes. So this is not even stress. So they're they're they they are using this model. I mean, they did talk about it in terms of heat stress initially, but then they used it for serum inducible. So if you look at the CFOS gene, you see the same thing? I have no idea. Okay, maybe we will interrupt here the discussion, which is very interesting. We can move it to the panel discussion because we're already waiting for our next like, speaker. But uh, maybe we can take one more, but not discussion, a short question, if we have one. Okay, if not, then we should thank um, Amir for very much.